I don't have a particular text I'm going to read from today, but the topic of my sermon is going to be the full divinity and full humanity of Jesus Christ. And I have three basic points that I would like to share in my sermon. The very first point is going to be an introduction to Christology. The second point is going to be the full divinity of the Son. And the third point will be the full humanity of Christ God the Logos. So again, I have three basic points in my sermon today, and I'm tasked today with addressing an important topic. This is essential to the gospel. And I'll just tell you this, I've got several references today. I've done lots of research on this topic. So what I'll do, because there's so much, I will, in the YouTube video when it's posted online, in the the description section, I'll add uh, some notations in there, some recommended books, and also um, some references for uh, my uh, sermon today. Now, of course, I have many biblical texts that I'm going to share, many. So what I'm going to provide is basically a concise and cogent overview of all of these biblical texts, and I'll provide exegesis over some very important points that you need to know to help you understand what we would call today the hypostatic union of Christ Jesus. Also in this sermon, I want you uh, to be aware that while I'm going to be addressing several different texts, if you go to our uh, church YouTube page, Trinity Gospel Church, I've actually preached um, full-length sermons on every one of the texts that I've shared today. We have about 35 hours of sermons available on the Trinity and Christology, so uh, you're more than welcome to go there and to check out uh, the verses in its entirety. So let me get started first with the introduction. Introduction to Christology. Immediately, I want to share with you guys a proper definition for what was known today as the hypostatic union of Jesus Christ. The hypostatic union of Jesus Christ basically means that the divinity and the humanity were inseparably or indissolubly united in one person. That essentially is the doctrine of the hypostatic union. And yes, it is an essential to the gospel. It is absolutely essential that one believes that the person of the Son became incarnate and that he is holy God and holy man in one person. Christ made this abundantly clear in the Gospel of John, when he said, you shall die in your sins if you do not believe that I am he. Notice he said, I am he. You will die in your sins. So again, also in this first point, remember I'm on my first point, introduction to Christology. I want to warn you that there are several disclaimers you need to be aware of because If you don't understand Christology and you say things about Christ, you could fall into some serious heresy. You could fall into some serious, serious heresy. Let me share with you several things heretics will say, and then I'll provide you guys definitions or tell you basically what it's called. For example, today you'll find that some heretics will say that Christ was not fully God, in scripture, they're going to say that God had adopted him at some point during his earthly pilgrimage. That's the heresy called adoptionism. Heretics are going to argue that Jesus Christ, when he assumed a human nature, they're going to say that his divine soul swallowed up or substituted the human soul. That's popularly known today as Apollinarianism. Several years ago, several centuries ago, actually, a known heretic by the name of Arius once said that there was once a time when Christ was not. That is the heresy called Arianism. Another notable heresy would be to say that Jesus is not fully human. That's the heresy called Docetism. Additionally, one of the most popular heresies today is when people talk about Christ. They say that during the Incarnation, He had divested himself of his power. He laid aside his deity or that he had only restricted access to the divine attributes. That's the heresy known as kenosis. Additionally, some heretics today will argue that Jesus Christ during the incarnation only has one nature. Well, that's the heresy called monophysitism. Other heretics will say that Jesus Christ is two persons. 
Literally, they believe in a two-person Christ. That's called Nestorianism. If you guys want, I actually wrote uh, a theological position paper on Nestorianism, and it was published in a <coughs> journal. And if you guys like a copy of that, let me know. I'll be happy to send it to you. But it's a, it's a dangerous heresy that is certainly being resurrected today. I promise you it's a dangerous heresy. Additionally, there's other notable heresies, like some heretics will say that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit make up components of God, but when they coalesce together is when they make up God. That's the heresy called partialism. Other heretics will say that Jesus Christ is ontologically subordinate uh, to the Father. That's simply the heresy called subordinationism. And lastly, heretics will say, well, Jesus is God, the Father is God, the Holy Spirit is God, therefore we believe in three different gods. That's the heresy called tritheism. We don't believe in three different gods. We believe in one God who exists in a trinity of distinct persons. So that's the second disclaimer that's important in my introduction. Now here's the third disclaimer. When you study Christology, you must contrast verbs. It is absolutely essential that you contrast verbs. Let me give you an example. If you were to read John 1.14, it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten, full of grace and truth. Now, the verb in there is the word became. He became. Now, if you look at most lexicons, it'll say, come into existence. That's what it is. However, what was the verb that took place prior to that in verse 1? Verse 1, there's actually three clauses. And the author used the word was in verse 1. In the beginning, was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Now, that's not just any verb. That's a, a static verb. And I'm going to explain that in detail when I get through my sermon. You have to contrast these verbs. If you go to the verb that says became and you ignore the verb that says was, you're likely going to fall into what's popularly known today as Arianism. A lot of people go to the examples of his humanity and ignore his divinity. For example, yes, the Bible does say that the Father is greater than the Son. The Bible says that the Father is head of Christ. The Bible does say that Jesus didn't know the day or the hour. Where he had to grow in wisdom and stature. But there's other texts in the Bible where Jesus said things that only God could say. So you cannot take one position and ignore the other. You have to address both because he is fully God and he is fully man. You have to address both. So again, you have to contrast these verbs. Fourth disclaimer that you need to be aware of in my introduction is you have to remember the doctrine of the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity, again, is the most important doctrine of the Bible because you can't say you know the gospel unless you know whose gospel it belongs to. You must know that. Now, regarding the doctrine of the Trinity, this is important, okay? Basically, I would just simply state that there is one true God who exists in a plurality or trinity of persons. The Bible gives us several data for this. For example... If you look at the Old Testament, there's a beautiful text in the, what's called the Septuagint reading. It literally says this. It says, Israel. It says, Kyrios o Theos Simon, Kyrios is SD. Now, if you notice the first part, Akue, you ever hear of the term acoustic? You get the sound acoustic? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So when you read that passage, that leads us to believe that we are monotheists, not tritheists. Put it another way, in simple terms. We believe in one God. We don't believe in three different gods. Again, we are monotheists. We believe in one God who exists in a trinity of persons. Additionally, the Bible is very clear that God is tripersonal, not unipersonal. The Bible gives us several examples of this. For example, in the, what's popularly known today as the triadic formula in Matthew 28, it says, uh, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, you have to be careful for cults. If you were to run into a cult member, typically someone who denies the Trinity, it could be a modalist, an Aryan, etc., they're going to say, hold on a minute, 
that doesn't teach the doctrine of the Trinity. They're going to say anoma, name, in that text is singular. So they're going to say the singular name in Matthew 28 means that it's referring to a unipersonal God and not a tripersonal God. So here's where they're grossly mistaken. To argue that the word anoma or name is, uh, because it's singular, it can't refer to plurality of persons. I always say, what about the Old Testament? What about when, remember those wicked men tried to build a tower as high up to heavens as they possibly could? And what was said? They said, let us make a name for itself. Name is plural, and that's referring to a plurality of persons. So you have to show them with the grammar how their arguments, again, are self-refuting. Because when you actually read that text, the, the triadic formula in uh, Matthew 28, if you read the triadic formula in Matthew 28, what you do have is Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And guess what? All three of these nouns are of the same case. Each one of these nouns are connected by the conjunction and, and each one of these nouns actually has the definite article the. So do you know what that means? That's referring to what's called the Granville Sharp Rule. So literally the reading of the text is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That indicates Trinitarian plurality. Or put another way, it basically means that all three persons are distinct and not referring to the same person. Now here's an important disclaimer you have to remember about the doctrine of the Trinity. In the nature of God, and it's very important that you understand this, in the nature of God, there is no derivation, there is no hierarchy, there is no superiority, inferiority, there is no processions. In fact, all the passages in the Bible where it says that the Father is head over Christ, or the Bible says that the Son submits to the Father, or that the Spirit proceeds uh, from the Son, those are all incarnational texts. Those are all texts that take place referring to what's called the economy of redemption. You don't read incarnational texts and collapse them into the nature of God. You will fall into heresy. My last point in my introduction I want to highlight is a sample text. I want to share with you guys a sample text highlighting how Christ is fully God and fully man in one person. Beautiful text. Probably one of my favorite texts in the Bible. Mark 14, uh, I believe it's 61 through 62. You remember when the high priest says, you know, tell us if you are the Christ, the, the son of the living God. And Christ responded to him and he said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power, coming with the clouds of heaven. I want you to remember that. Mark 14, 61 through 62. He says, I am, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power, coming with the clouds <clears throat> of heaven. Now, let's pause here for a moment. This text is significant. I don't think you guys realize just how significant it is. Maybe you do. But let me just tell you this. First of all, notice the emphasis of I am. When Christ said I am, by the way, if one of us were to say I am, it doesn't really have much meaning now, does it? Why? Because all of us here are created beings. All of us here are sinners. But if Christ says it, it means something. And the reason why is because it's significance of how it's used in the Bible. If you go back all the way to Exodus, dealing with Moses at the burning bush, notice how it was God that appeared and said, I am who I am. But what took place prior to that? It was the angel of the Lord that was speaking first. And then the Lord speaks, which shows us that angel of the Lord and Lord are used interchangeably. Now, that doesn't mean every time you see angel of the Lord in the Bible, that means it's referring to God. No, context must determine when that is applied. But clearly the context and Exodus is showing us that angel of the Lord and the Lord are used interchangeably. Additionally, a lot of scholars believe that when Jesus said, I am throughout the New Testament, that it's referring to in Hebrew, it was what's called the anihu statements. In other words, it just simply means I am in Hebrew, but basically a notable text that a lot of scholars believe it's referring to would be Deuteronomy 32, 39. 
where it says, see now that I, even I am he, and there's no God besides me. I kill and I make alive, I wound and I heal, and there's none that can deliver out of my hand, no, not one. But the fact that he says, see now that I, even I am he, okay? I am he. Think about all the times in the New Testament, Jesus said, I am. He said, I am the door of the sheep, the good shepherd, the light of the world, the bread of life, the true vine, the resurrection and the life and the way, the truth and the life. And John 8, 58, most notably, he said, before Abraham was, I am. What do you think that means? Before Abraham was, I am. He's basically saying, Abraham is created, but he's the creator. He's saying, Abraham is a sinner, but he's the savior. He's saying, Abraham once had a beginning, but Christ has no beginning. So basically, in that text in Mark, when Jesus told the high priest, I am, what that indicates is his eternality, his immutability, his impeccability, his consubstantiality. He's saying something that only God could say. And that's important. Remember what I said to you before about what the Gospel of John says. You will die in your sins unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Now, additionally, that's not all Jesus said before the high priest. Before the high priest, he says, I am, and you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of power, coming with the clouds of heaven. What do you think he was referring to? He was referring to Daniel chapter seven. He was basically saying he is the son of man who shares glory with the ancient of days back in Daniel chapter seven. He's literally directly <clears throat> citing it. Let me tell you what Daniel chapter seven says. Daniel chapter seven, verse 13 through 14 says, I looked through the night visions and behold, one like the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him. And it was given to him a kingdom and dominion and a glory that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. So you see, Christ is clearly pointing us to Daniel chapter seven and to say that he is coming on the clouds of heaven. Literally, Jesus was saying something that only God could say because only God could come on the clouds of heaven. So therefore, it is a claim to his deity. Some people today think, well, son of man refers to his humanity and son of God refers to his divinity. No, read Daniel chapter seven. That has nothing to do with his humanity. That has everything to do with his divinity. Because in Daniel chapter seven, you clearly see a distinction of persons. You see the son of man in the ancient of days both of them are fully divine and both of them have shared glory. The fact that the Bible says that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. Now, some cults will tell you, we don't believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. There is no Trinity in the Bible because that would mean there's thrones in heaven and you won't find anything about thrones in heaven. Well, I beg to differ. If you read Daniel chapter seven, if you actually take a look at verse nine, do you know what it says? It says the thrones plural, were put into place. Now, only a Trinitarian can account for the plurality that's used there. There was a good friend of mine prior to his death. He used to always say, we love when we see singular and plurality. Problem is for the Unitarian that denies the Trinity, they can't account for that. They can only expect to see singular, but for Trinitarians, we love when we see singular and plurality because we believe in one God who exists in a Trinity of persons. So the point to be said is that Jesus Christ and his discussion with the high priest, he says, and you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of power coming with the clouds of heaven. Only God can come on the clouds of heaven. Therefore, Christ made a claim that only God could say. So again, that's a beautiful testimony. And I promise you this right now. Any reputable scholar that you find that has written on the Trinity will tell you that when it says that all people's nations and languages should serve him, the serving that is used there is the highest form of worship. To give that type of worship to anyone else except God would be regarded not as biblical, but as blasphemy. Okay, so this is my introduction. I'm now officially uh, complete with my introduction to Christology. Now what I want to do is take it to my second point. And my second point will be the full divinity of the Son. I've got several texts I want to take you to. You all are more than welcome to take your Bible there. If not, I'll just share with you uh, what it states um, again, if you want to hear something expounded more in great detail, trust me, go to my church page. Uh, all the texts I share with you, I preached hours on, on each individual text. So if you want some more content on it, if we have questions after, 
uh, the service, definitely come and talk to me. So let's talk now really briefly about the uh, full divinity of the Son. Immediately, I want to take you to John 1 because there's several things you need to understand about John 1. John 1, specifically verse 1, there are three clauses in uh, John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Notice the emphasis on the word was. Now, that verb that is used is not just an ordinary verb. It's a static verb, and it's also in what's called the imperfect tense. Now, if you don't know what an imperfect tense means, I'll explain it to you. Basically, it, it refers to his self-existence and his eternality. I was reading the Rogers and Rogers lexicon, and it, and it points out that this imperfect tense that is used explicitly in John 1 refers to his continuous and timeless being. So the first clause is pretty simple. It literally says, in the beginning was the word. So before the creation of the world began was the word. So again, this highlights here his preexistence, his eternality, and in his what's called continuous and timeless existence, as I just mentioned it. Second clause is just as important. But what's unique about the second clause grammatically opposes a major problem for people that deny the Trinity. Because if you actually look at the Greek text, it literally says, and the word was with the God. Okay, the God, the word and the God. Now, what's unique about this is that the author used a beautiful preposition. In Greek, it's proston theon, was with the God. Now, out of all the prepositions of the Bible, this right here is significant because most grammarians will tell you that this right here metaphorically literally means face to face with, or it refers to the fact that there is a distinction of persons between the two, and it also shows this intercommunion between the Father and the Son. Now, again, that's a major problem for people that deny the Trinity now, because you're going to be surprised. Cults will say that the emphasis on the word in John 1 simply means that Jesus is nothing more than an abstraction or a concept or an expression in the mind of God. Good luck with that one. That's what I tell the heretics because of the fact that if you read that second clause, again, it's preceded by the imperfect tense was with the God. So literally before the creation of the world, it shows that they're distinct persons. Both of them are fully divine. It shows the intercommunion that exists between both of them. Now, the last clause can be a little tricky for some people. The last clause says, and the word was God. Now, you're going to have to be careful because cults will try to take you to task on this one. God in that passage, there's debate typically if you read a bunch of commentaries, people will say, well, God is either definite, indefinite, or qualitative. Now, if you don't know what those words mean, again, I'll explain. Definite means it says the God. Indefinite means it says a God. And qualitative basically is highlighting or stressing something. That's basically what that means. Now, the reason why cults try to bring this argument up a lot, here's why. Remember what cults believe. They believe that Jesus and the Father refer to the same person. So they believe the text says, the word was the God. So they're going to say Jesus and the Father are the same person. Cults are going to deny that Jesus is fully God. So they're going to say it's indefinite. They're going to say, and the word was a God. But what they fail to realize, when you look at the grammar of God that's used in John 1, 1, uh, C, the, the last clause of John 1, 1, is that God is what's called an anarthrist predicate nominative. It's a million dollar word, right? <laughs> but let me explain to you real quick. Anarthrist basically means there's no article. Okay, predicate, you guys, I'm sure you guys know what that means. And nominative basically means it's a subject. So therefore, you have to take this word as being qualitative. Now, what qualitative means is that it's simply just highlighting the nature of the sun. That's basically what it means. I would challenge you guys, if you like to buy books and read them, buy uh, Greek Grammar Beyond the Basics because it really shows um, how to define uh, some of these qualitative terms. Because this book literally says it means stresses the nature, essence, or substance of the Son. So literally when you read John 1.1, 1, 1, it re literally reads uh, basically that Jesus is eternal. He is distinct from the Father. And he is in every way God. That's basically what uh, John 1.1 1, 1 teaches. And that's fact. That is, again, no one can dispute that. Heretics will try, but they fail every time. 
Another notable text I want to take you to is uh, John 1.18. John 1.18, this Bible text says, No one has seen God at any time. It says, The begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. He hath declared him. Now, for the purpose of education, I want to share with you guys the Greek text, because I guarantee you there's going to be one Greek word you're going to know. Some people say, well, it's all Greek to me, right? But there's one Greek word you are definitely going to know because you want to know where it derives from. Literally, the reading in the Greek text of John 1.18 says, O manogenis ios, o on iston kolpon tu patros, ekinos exegisato. So you hear the word exegisato, right? That's where you get the word exegesis. That's literally where the word exegesis comes from. So if a pastor says, I am exegeting the Bible, or I am an exegete of Scripture, that means basically to draw out. That means to expound. That means to declare something. <clears throat> so again, in the text, when the Bible says that no one has seen God at any time, and then it says, the begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Okay, so let's talk about this for a moment. The verb that's used, is, is, the begotten Son who is, in the bosom of the Father. This verb literally indicates his continuous being. Literally, it indicates his continuous being. So when you're reading this passage, you clearly see a distinction of persons, Father and the Son. And I believe it was a scholar by the name of Harris who said that the way that the grammar is used, it basically shows a permanent presence with the Father. So again, it's another beautiful text to show how Christ has declared the Father, and yet they're distinct persons, but they share the same divine nature. And that's a beautiful text that highlights the fact that he is fully God. Now, here's a text I want to spend a few moments on, and it definitely is my go-to passage, so to speak, when I evangelize cults. John 17.5. John 17.5 is my go-to text, and I pray you guys pay careful attention to detail to the exegesis I provide, because I promise you, if you can remember some of the points that I share with you, you're going to be a problem for cults. They're not going to like you very much, but I promise you this, that if you share this truth with them, if again, if it's God's will and the Holy Spirit accompanies the word that you preach and they're God's elect, praise God for the fruits that you may see from that. John 17, 5, Jesus prayed to the Father. He said, uh, Father, glorify me, with yourself, with the glory I had with you before the world began. Now, listen to this text of Jesus. It's important. Immediately notice how he says, Father. Do you guys know that Father here in this text is in what's called the vocative case? I'll explain what that means. It means the case of address. It means he is literally addressing the Father. Well, that's a problem for people that believe the Father and the Son refer to the same person. Because the son is addressing the father. It is in the vocative case, so don't forget that. But here's what's even more beautiful about reading John 17, 5. Jesus spoke in the first person twice. And he spoke about the father in the second person twice. So listen to this. Jesus says, father, vocative case, he's addressing him. Glorify me, first person with yourself, second person, with the glory I had, first person, with you before the world began, second person. Problem for people that believe that Jesus and the Father refer to the same person, okay? Now listen to this, okay, about the second person, how Jesus referred to the Father and the second person. This is an important grammatical construction you need to remember. Jesus used uh, a preposition and a date of construction. And if you read how this is used in scripture, oh, it signifies something very important. Uh, a dative basically means that it is an indirect object. You obviously know what a preposition is, but when he says, with yourself, in Greek, it's the word paraseofto, with yourself. And then the second time he said, with you. Again, that's a preposition and a dative. Parasi. In both times, the preposition, the dative, according to the Greek grammar beyond the basics, it literally says it means uh, proximity or nearness or association with someone or something. Again, it's just highlighting the fact that they are distinct persons. 
Additionally, look what else the text says. With the glory I had with you before the world began. So clearly this text reveals his eternality, his preexistence, the fact that he is in every way God, but distinct from the Father, and they had shared glory before the foundation of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, God gives his glory to no one. God gives his glory to no one. But if you understand the doctrine of the Trinity, you'll understand that we believe in one God who exists in a trinity of co-glorious persons. So that's a beautiful text highlighting the full divinity of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now let's go to probably one of the most notable texts in the Bible. Some people call this next text I'm about to share with you, the Carmen Christi. Now exegetically, I'm not convinced it's a hymn, um, but that's besides the point. But Philippians chapter two, verse six through eight is a text that I'd like to um, ask you to take a quick look at. Philippians chapter two, verse six through eight literally reads this. It says, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and was made in the likeness of men. It says, and being fashioned as a man, and he humbled himself and became obedient. That's what Philippians chapter two, verse six through eight says. Now, please uh, pay careful attention to detail to the exegesis or to the commentary that I'll provide on it. Immediately, notice how he says, being in the form of God. Being, when you look at that word, it basically just means that he has always existed as God. That's literally what it is. Being that's used literally indicates continuous being. Now, when it says form, being in the form of God, well, some of you may say, what does form mean? Well, I agree with uh, uh, an old theologian by the name of Lightfoot. He basically said that the form, in Greek it's the word morphi, basically means the, the, the sum of essential attributes. So essentially, that first section where it says, who being in the form of God, just simply means that he has always existed as God. Always. I heard one... Uh, preachers say he did not cease to be what he has always been. Um, I couldn't explain it better than that. That's a pretty uh, <clears throat> sound way of explaining it. But here's what's even more unique. When you examine Philippians 2, remember I always said you have to contrast verbs. The verb that's used there, being. You have to contrast verse 6 where it says being in the form of God with verse 7. Because verse 7 says he took on the form of the bondservant. And it says he was made in the likeness of men. So made, made in the likeness of men, being in the form of God. Verse six, verse seven, you have to contrast. Because one is dealing with this full divinity. The other one is dealing with this full <coughs> humanity. Divinity, humanity, you have to contrast. If you go to the section where it says he was made in the likeness of men and you ignore the fact that he has always existed in the form of God, you're going to fall into heresy. Similarly, or con in contrast, if you go to that verb being and you ignore the text where it says was made in the likeness of men, you're also going to fall into heresy also. I shared with you some of those heresies earlier, either Arianism or Docetism. So you have to address them in context, but always remember that Jesus Christ is fully God and he's fully man. Always remember that. But what's unique about verse 6 is that it comes before verse seven. Now here's why that's unique. In verse seven, it says that he had, was made in the likeness of men, but in verse six, it says he has always existed as God. So that clearly shows us that he is eternal. So people today deny the eternality of Christ, show them how come then it shows us here that he has always existed as God, but yet in verse seven, we see he was made in the likeness of men, but one comes before the other. So that right there uh, is a great Christological passage to, to prove that Jesus Christ is eternal. But in verse six, he also said he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now, this is a pretty simplistic text. Uh, there was a, a, a minister by the name of uh, Hellerman. He made a good point. He basically said um, the text basically just means that he possessed it, but chose not to exploit. It doesn't mean he lacked it but couldn't acquire it, okay? So again, the text is clearly dealing with his uh, humanity or taking upon himself uh, uh, human flesh or assuming a human nature. 
especially of verse 7 that's about to come up. Now, in verse 7, take a look at your text in verse 7. But he says, but he made himself of no reputation. Now, here you have a verb and what's called a reflexive pronoun. Okay, you have a verb and a reflexive pronoun. The verb is made. The reflexive pronoun is himself. Now, what does the reflexive pronoun signify? I'll tell you what it signifies, that he voluntarily did it himself. That's basically what it means. This is something he voluntarily took upon himself, which is consistent with all of Scripture. Literally, if you read Scripture, we see Jesus, his work was voluntary. Notable example would be John 10. Jesus said, as the Father loves me because I laid down my life and I take it up again, for no one takes it from me, for I lay it down on my own accord. For I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it up again. This is the commandment that I have received from my Father. So we see examples of that from the Bible. Okay, now, here is the, the, the section that a lot of people commit great heresy on. And I'm just going to be honest, you want to avoid this. In verse 7, where he says he made himself of no reputation. The section of no reputation. Let me tell you what I've commonly heard throughout the years, what people say. And then being honest with you, people fall into serious heresy in this section, making himself of no reputation. The first one I've always heard was that Jesus Christ had divested himself of his power. The second one I've heard is that he laid aside his deity. The third one I heard, and believe it or not, this is almost a direct quote, partially paraphrased from a very notable minister. This notable minister said that in his commentary on Matthew 24 about Jesus not knowing the day or the hour, um, he said that Jesus only had restricted access to the divine attributes during the incarnation. Now, I'm going to address who that was in a little bit when I get to another text. But all three of those positions are heresy. I'm going to say it again. They're heresy. Nowhere does the text say he made himself of no reputation because he divested himself of his deity. The text doesn't say he made himself of no reputation by laying aside his power. It doesn't say he made himself of no reputation by only having restricted access to the divine attributes. It doesn't say that. You have to examine the verbs. Look at the verbs in your Bible. It literally says, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men, and this is being fashioned as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient. Look at the verbs. The verbs tells you how to interpret what it means when it says, of no reputation. So literally, when you take a look at when the text says, made himself of no reputation, you know what that means? That literally means, it's referring to his incarnation, his humiliation, his suffering, his obedience, and his death on behalf of his particular people. That's what it's referring to. It has nothing to do with laying aside his deity or having uh, restricted access to the divine attributes. It has nothing to do with the issue of him uh, divesting himself of his power. So again, avoid those heresies because those heresies are popularly known today as kenosis. They are heresy. And you cannot make apologies for how you are to call it up. A few more texts in the New Testament I want to address. I want to drive, draw your attention now to Colossians 1.16. I'm going to share a verse you guys popularly know. And I'm just going to address this one very briefly uh, because there's a few grammatical points. Colossians 1.16 basically says, By him all things are created in heaven and earth, visible or invisible, whether thrones or dominions, principalities or powers, all things are made through him and for him. Now, what I want to simply highlight when you're reading Colossians 1.16 is the fact that there are three prepositional phrases, okay? You have a preposition and a dative, a preposition and a genitive, and a preposition and an accusative, okay? So the preposition and the dative, by him. A dative simply means an indirect object. By him. Now, this is important because it's by him that all things are created. So I think it was... Uh, a grammarian by the name of Melek who said that the by him, the preposition and the dative means that it's referring to what he conceived and all of its complexities. This is today why, why any Trinitarian you speak to that knows the text will tell you that this literally means in the mind of Christ, he provides the blueprint for all things, nothing excluded. And the second grammatical construction is super important. Okay, it's not just important, it's super important because it is a preposition followed by the reference to him. 
The preposition and the genitive. Genitive means possession. Possession. Through him. Through him is what he's saying. Every time you see this grammatical construction and it refers to Christ, and by the way, it's in Hebrews chapter one. You'll also see it in John one also. Through him and every single time in the Bible it's used for Christ refers to ultimate agency. So guess what that means? He is the creator is what it means. And then you have the last prepositional phrase, for him. You have the preposition and the accusative. The preposition and the accusative basically indicates the goal, the whole purpose of why he does things. So I've literally labeled these three prepositional phrases as what's called the three C's of Christology. Christ conceived all things, he created all things, and he controls all things for his glory. Now, another notable text I want to address is in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. And I know you guys know this verse very well. Believe it or not, this is probably to Greeks today that uh, read the Bible. Uh, I'm not talking about the Greek Orthodox folks, but actual Christians that live in Greece. Uh, Colossians 2, 9 is probably one of the most beautiful texts in the Greek New Testament. It literally says, Oti en afto keteki pento pliromatis deotitos somatikos. It's one of the most beautiful texts in the Bible because it literally reads, um, In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now, listen to the exegesis I provide very briefly on this. In this passage, he uses the reference to dwells. But don't just look at it as dwells, it's much more than that. You have to take a look at how this verb is used. I believe it was uh, Harris who argued that it means permanently dwell. And the reason why you have to take the permanently dwell approach is because of the fact it doesn't say in him dwells just the Godhead bodily, but it's all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now, when you read Godhead in Colossians 2.9, you're going to have to contrast this with the reference to Godhead in Romans 1 verse 20. Now, if you read Romans 1.20, you know Godhead is used there also, right? where it says his invisible attributes are clearly seen throughout the creation of the world, where it talks about his eternal power and Godhead. So they are without excuse. So you see Godhead is also used in uh, uh, Romans 1.20, but that has a different meaning than what you're going to see in Colossians 2.9. It does. It has a different meaning. And believe it or not, even if I look at my Greek New Testament, they read differently as well. For example, if I look at the Greek New Testament, for the reference to Godhead that's used in Romans 1.20, it literally reads this, Theotis. Well, that's not what it says when you look, look at uh, Colossians 2.9. In Colossians 2.9, it says, Theotitos. So if you look at the lexicons, one of my most go-to lexicons for Greek specifically would be what's called the BDAG lexicon. And it shows that the reference to Godhead in Romans, Romans 1.20 refers to the divine qualities, but the emphasis of Godhead in Colossians 2.9 refers to the divine essence. So in him permanently dwells all of the fullness of deity, but then he says bodily. Now we got to pay careful attention to detail to this word bodily. Bodily indicates the incarnation, the fact that he assumed a human nature. He had a true body. Now, basically, what uh, the author is doing here is basically highlighting that the person of the Son who became incarnate exercised and possessed all of the plentitude of deity when he walked this earth. He has always existed in the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Is essentially what he's teaching. Now, here's why this is important. Remember what I shared with you before. You got to be careful. A lot of times people tend to rely on commentaries. They go to commentaries or they go to a favorite pastor, a favorite apologist, and they don't realize some of these guys will openly teach heresy. For example, I was reading a commentary in Matthew 24, um, and uh, this popular pastor said regarding Jesus not knowing the day or the hour, he said that's because, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, but for the most part, I'm almost directly quoting him. But he said that during the incarnation, he said Christ only had restricted access to the divine attributes and didn't likely regain it until after the resurrection. Ladies and gentlemen, that is heresy. Okay, and guess who taught that? John MacArthur. John MacArthur taught that heresy. And uh, and that's what I tell people. Stop reading that garbage. 
But one thing I will tell you is this. When you read Colossians 2.9, does Colossians 2.9 say, in him dwells only the, re- the restricted access to the divine attributes bodily? No, it doesn't say that. It says, in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. It has no emphasis there on restrictions or divesting himself of any deity or power. And it says nothing in that passage about uh, Jesus Christ being limited in any sense. In fact, the text is clearly teaching that during the incarnation, that he is in every way God, and that he has exercised and possessed all the fullness of the divine attributes. I had a friend of mine that actually wrote a book on the the omnipresence of Christ, probably one of the best I've read on the topic, defending uh, that a specific point I just made right now with you. Um, the last uh, text I want to address uh, about the full divinity, and then I'm going to go to the humanity, would be Hebrews 1. And I'm just going to lightly touch on this, okay? Hebrews 1, what I want to highlight about Hebrews 1, because, again, the whole chapter deals with Christology, but I want to highlight Hebrews 1 just to show you guys how many times the Father refers to the Son as God. How many times you're going to see that? It's beautiful. For example, if you're looking at Hebrews chapter 1, notice how the text says, Thy throne, O God, but of the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God. There's the first time. Go in the very next verse, the subsequent text, verse 9, and it says, Thou hast loved um, uh, righteousness and hated iniquity, God, even thy God. So you have in the first one, Thy throne, O God, and then the verse 9, it says, God, even thy God. So here, you see there's clear examples of Trinitarian plurality. Ladies and gentlemen, only a Trinitarian can account for these two passages. Well, it gets even better. If you take a look at verse 10 in Hebrews chapter 1, it literally says, Thou, Lord, hast laid the foundation of the world. Do you guys know that Lord there is in the vocative case? And I taught you guys earlier what vocative case means. It means the case of address. Literally, the case of of address, So you literally have in the text, the father addressing the son as Lord. And what did we read earlier? We literally read the text earlier, and then we sang it at, from our Psalter. Psalm 102, 25 through 20, that's what I'm citing from. In Hebrews 1, verse 10 through 12, that right there is Psalm 102, 25 through 28. Well, why did the author cite it for? Well, if you read Psalm 102, 25 through 28, You'll notice that it's referring to the absolute sovereignty of God. So the author cites Psalm 102, 25 through 28 and applies it to Christ. He's saying Christ is the absolute sovereign God of Scripture. That's exactly what he's doing. It's the most, one of the most beautiful texts that we've seen in Scripture. Additionally, look at verse 13. Look at 13 of your text of Hebrews chapter 1. It says, but which of the angels did he say, sit at my right hand? What text do you think that's referring to? That's referring to Psalm 110. But what took place before he said at the right hand? It says, the Lord said to my Lord. The Lord said to my Lord. So how many times do you see the Father addressing the Son as God or Lord? Now you have to be careful because if you run into Jews, they're going to try to take you to task on Psalm 110 verse uh, 1. Because the text says, the Lord said to my Lord... Well, the second reference of Lord, here's what a Jewish person is going to tell you, typically a rabbi. They're going to say, first of all, you don't even know Hebrew. That's the problem with you Protestants. You don't know Hebrew, so you don't realize that that doesn't say Adonai. That says Adoni. And they're going to show you examples in the Bible where Adoni does refer to a created being and not used for God. Okay, that's what they're going to do. Well, how are you going to respond? And that's what I tell people. You're going to have to learn how to defend these arguments also because What I would tell people is you have to remember something about words. Words sometimes don't have uh, uh, one meaning. They have several, but the context determine how that's used. Let me explain a little bit. For example, doesn't the Bible refer to Ezekiel as son of man? He's referred to as son of man, but Christ is called son of man. Now, when the Bible calls Ezekiel son of man, that doesn't mean the Bible's calling him God. But when the Bible refers to Jesus as son of man, clearly that's an emphasis that he is God. So that's the point I'm trying to get across. So when you actually look at what's called the Brown Driver's Briggs Lexicon in Hebrew, um, you'll see that the reference to Adoni, yes, there are examples where it does refer to a created being, 
But there's other examples where it does refer to God. Context has to determine, but let me show you guys how to easily refute their arguments. Who is at the right-hand side of the Father in verse 1? Adoni. Well, if you go to verse 5 of the same chapter, Psalm 110, you'll notice that in that verse it says, the Lord is at the right-hand side, but you've got to look at it in the Hebrew, not in the English. Because if you look at it in the Hebrew, it actually says Adonai. It says Adonai. Now, when you look at Adonai, uh, most scholars will tell you, especially Thayer, uh, Thayer's lexicon points out that it's a proper name of God. So essentially, what you see in verse 1 is Adoni, and then in verse 5 it says Adonai, which shows that Adoni and Adonai are used interchangeably to refer to the same person. Mm. Again, so again, the text, why I'm emphasizing that, because that's what Paul cited from in Hebrews 1. In Hebrews 1, which of the angels did he say, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Quick overview on point number two. Now let's go to our uh, third and final point. The third and final point will be the full humanity of Christ, God, the Logos. Now it's time to talk about the humanity of Christ. Because remember what I said to you earlier. Um, Jesus Christ is holy God and he's holy man in one person. Now, a key text that I want to highlight and spend some time on would be John 1.14. John 1.14 uh, literally says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten, full of grace and truth. Now, if you look at most lexicons, and you'll take a look at that word became, became flesh. It literally means to be made or to come into existence. But again, remember what I said before, you have to contrast verbs. You must contrast verbs, because if you go to that verb, and act like the verb was, the imperfect tense that's used in John 1, 1, doesn't exist, then you're basically falling into Arianism. And you can't take a look at the, the verb was in John 1, 1 and ignore the verb became like it doesn't exist. Otherwise, you're falling into Docetism. You have to address them both. Now, clearly here we see that Jesus Christ assumed a human nature. And it says, and we beheld his glory. Now, let me tell you something about the glory of Christ that's described here. Another issue that people say that don't understand Christology very well, some people tend to think that the only time Christ displayed his glory during the incarnation is during the transfiguration. No, that's, that's actually not true. Believe it or not, glory is an expression of who Christ is. So all of God's elect beheld his glory. Okay, it's not just the transfiguration. Because glory is a reflection of who Christ is. Christ is glory. Now, of course, the reprobate are not able to see his glory. The Bible says that God has uh, actively and unconditionally predestined them for um, everlasting conscious torment. Okay? And therefore, he has blinded their eyes and, and hardened their hearts so they can never see or understand the truth. Just read John 12, 39 through 40, and you'll see the point I'm trying to get across. So they're not going to behold his glory. But to say that Christ had veiled glory, I hear that all the time. Well, during the incarnation, Christ had only veiled glory. Where does the text in John 1 say, and the word became flesh and we beheld his veiled glory? The veiled glory of the only begotten full of grace and truth? It doesn't say that. The text says, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten full of grace and truth. So address the text in context. There is no veiled glory that's described in that passage. Additionally, I want you guys to be reminded of, of several important things about uh, the humanity of Christ, because a lot of people will stumble into some serious heresy. So I'll share some things with you that you may have heard, you may not have heard. Um, I always ask people when I meet them, especially when they come into my church. Um, as you guys know, we're a church here, Trinity Gospel Church. The name Trinity should tell you guys that we put a, a strong emphasis here on the, the doctrine of the Trinity and Christology. And and when people come here, I always ask them, have you ever heard a full sermon on the hypostatic union? Have you ever heard a full sermon on the Trinity? Have you ever heard sermon series on this where it just specifically addresses the divinity and the humanity or the doctrine of the Trinity? And, and a lot of people will say no. Now, that's a problem because that's one of the reasons why people today are going to slip into heresy. Or if they do talk about Christology, it's going to be vacuous it's going to be inept or shallow. So this is why I'm going to share some important points with you guys, okay? As you guys know, as I said before, what the doctrine of the hypostatic union means. The doctrine of the hypostatic union literally means that the humanity and divinity were inseparably or indissolubly united in one person. 
So notice I said there's two natures in one person. People today that argue for a one nature, Christ, that's the heresy of monophysitism. People that argue for a a two-person Christ, that's the heresy of Nestorianism. But that's not all the heresies that exist out there. Do you guys know that there are some people today that don't believe Jesus Christ uh, took upon himself a true body and a reasonable soul during the incarnation? Those are two very notable popular heresies. I was uh, reading um, an old minister by the name of Shaw, and he was pointing out even during his time that there were men that were trying to argue that Jesus didn't have a true body. It was just an illusion. It wasn't real. It descended from heaven. And again, clearly the Bible shows us that he he had a true body. For example, in Luke 1, doesn't Luke 1 tell us explicitly where it tells us that the angel said, Mary, uh, do not fear. You you have found favor with God and uh, you shall conceive a son and you shall give birth and you shall call his name Jesus. Don't we see in Galatians 4 when it says in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son born of a woman, born under the law? Don't we see other examples in the Bible like, I believe it's Hebrews chapter seven, where it says that he's a faithful high priest, holy, harmless, undefiled, separated from sinners. So we clearly see examples that he has a true body, but he also has a true uh, rational soul as well. A lot of people deny this and I'm like, Good grief, go to your Bible. They think it's philosophy when I say he assumed a rational soul. Now, the common arguments from the heretics are they're going to say that, well, yeah, he assumed a human body or he assumed um, a human nature. And they're going to argue, though, but the divine soul substituted the human soul or the divine soul had swallowed up the human soul. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the heresy called Apollinarianism. Okay, don't get into that stuff because that is heresy. Now, another argument that people are going to say is, well, we just don't believe he uh, assumed a rational soul. Well, if Jesus didn't have a rational soul, then, then you don't believe that he was fully human. That's the heresy of docetism. Okay, so you have to be aware of these heresies. One notable heretic once told me that he went to a secular dictionary, and that was his first problem. He went to a secular dictionary to look up the definition of a soul, and he says it re- denotes a person. So he says, if you believe Jesus Christ assumed a true body and a rational soul, then that means you believe in two persons of Christ. And I said, first of all, your first problem is you're looking at a secular dictionary. That's your first problem. Number two, you fail to realize is that the word soul, or in Greek, it's the word psychin in Greek. It has several different meanings depending upon the context. Context always drives the main point, always. So let me take you to scripture and show you guys how to define a soul and show you guys how it's used in scripture. For example, most notably, Matthew. Do you remember when Jesus said, do not fear him who was able to kill the body but unable to kill the soul? See how we mentioned soul, but rather fear him who was able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Now look at how clearly we see a distinction here. I was reading uh, Thayer's lexicon and it points out that the soul as an essence which differs from the body but not distinguished or I'm sorry, not um, dissolved by death. So clearly we see how soul is used there. Now most notably, let me show you guys a biblical text so you guys see I'm not talking philosophy. I'm not talking secular terminology. Soul is in the Bible. Jesus did uh, assume himself a true body and a rational soul. And the most notable text I would point you to is Matthew 26, 38. Remember Jesus in Matthew 26, 38, when he says, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. Do you guys see what I said? That's what Christ said. My soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. Now notice on that text, the author includes an adjective. Exceedingly sorrowful. Now, do you guys know this, that sorrowful is a human emotion? It's not a divine emotion. So if you're saying Jesus didn't have a human soul, then you're, are you, people, what they're doing is they're taking a human expression and applying it to the divine. That, ladies and gentlemen, is what heretics do. That is what heretics do. Let me give you a notable example. How many of you guys, by a show of hands, ever heard of a worldview called open theism? Okay, open theists believe that God can change his mind. Open theists believe God doesn't know everything. Open theists um, will basically tell you that 
You know, God has limited knowledge or they'll apply uh, physical characteristics uh, to the divine. And again, that's the problem today with heresy. Let me give you a real good example. An open theist, if they take a look at Genesis 6, where the Bible says the Lord repented, they're going to say, see, God changed his mind, not realizing that the Bible does use what's called anthropopathic and anthropomorphic terms. Now, let me explain what that means. Anthropopathic term basically means that the Bible is using a human expression to describe an action of God, but you never take a human expression to describe God and apply that to his divine nature. You never do that. I was reading a really solid book on that topic. It's called God Without Passions by Renahan. It's a really good book that highlights that point. Um, and the reason why you don't want to apply that to the divine nature, because doesn't the Bible tell us in Malachi, God does not change? Doesn't the Bible tell us in Numbers, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent? Think about how the Bible even uses what's called anthropopathic, uh, I'm sorry, anthropomorphic language. Now, anthropomorphic language basically means that the Bible is using a physical characteristic to describe an action of God, but you never take that and apply that to his divine nature. For example, here's an example of a physical characteristic of God as a metaphorical terminology. Doesn't the Bible say nothing will snatch this out of God's hand? That's what you call an anthropomorphic term, okay? So again, the Bible is using a human expression or a physical characteristic to describe an action of God, but you can't take that, apply that to his divine nature because the Bible says God is a spirit. That's the point I'm trying to get across. So when you read the text in Matthew 26, where it says, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death, you cannot take a human emotion and apply it to the divine. Therefore, the text is abundantly clear that G Jesus took upon himself a true body um, and a reasonable soul. Additionally, let's also talk about the will of Christ. Let's talk about that for a moment. Now, first, let me explain the distinction between the Trinity and Christology. When you look at the doctrine of the Trinity, remember this. Um, some people today will argue that there are three wills in God because there's three distinct persons. No, 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 no. A will is a function of nature. So if you argue that there's three wills in God, you're holding to a tritheistic or, or a semi-Aryan view of God. Don't ever hold to that view. A will is a function of nature. And therefore, since we have one God that we worship who exists in a trinity of persons, therefore, there's only one divine will. That's it. There is one will for the triune God, period. However, since a will is a function of nature, remember Christ assumed a human nature. So therefore, he assumed a human nature, so he has two natures, and therefore he has two wills. A great notable example of this would be in uh, Matthew 26, when Jesus said, if, if it is possible that this cup pass, not as I will, but as thou will. Now remember this about I will and thou will. Thou will. When he's referring to the divine will, well, Jesus isn't divorced from the Trinity. Jesus shares that divine will because all three persons are distinct, but they share the same divine nature and therefore share the same divine will. But when he says, but as I will, he of course is referring, or that's with respect to his human will. So that's why we see examples when Jesus said, he didn't know the day or the hour. Well, yeah, the Bible says he doesn't know the day or the hour, but I can show you other passages where the Bible clearly says he knows all things. That's not a contradiction. That's what you'd expect to see with proper Christology, knowing that he is fully God and fully man, that he has two natures and two wills. That is how you um, uh, are to address these passages. Additionally, I want to highlight the emphasis of begotten. Remember in John 1, 14, it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten. A lot of people have no clue how to interpret that word begotten. Okay, a lot of people, I hear terms like eternally begetting. And I'm like, what do you mean? How are you even interpreting that word begotten? Just take a look at the word in and of itself. In Greek, it's the word monogenes. Okay, so you have mono means one. You guys probably know that. And then genes, kind. So if you read um, the BDAG lexicon, it literally means one of a kind of its class, essentially what it means. So when you read the emphasis of begotten, it has nothing to do with origins. 
It doesn't have anything to do with origins. You can't confuse the emphasis of begotten with the word beget that's used in the genealogies. You know, when you take a look at the reference to beget, it typically means to give birth, right? That's used in the genealogy. This person begat this person. This person begot that person. Um, so you cannot confuse these two. Um, the emphasis to begotten is not referring to origins. It's referring to a unique, one-of-a-kind relationship that exists between the father and the son. In fact, I'll prove it to you. Um, and give you another example of how it's also used in the Bible. You guys know in the Hebrews how the Bible calls Isaac Abraham's only begotten son? You guys know that? So here's a question, even for our, our, our pastor brothers here and for all of you guys. So if Isaac is called Abraham's only begotten son, was he his firstborn son? No. Was he his only son? No. Therefore, begotten refers to that unique, one-of-a-kind relationship. That's why God is called the God of Abraham, Isaac, and also Jacob. So again, that's just the point that I wanted to highlight. I wanted to give you guys a, a quick overview of uh, Christology. Again, uh, in my sermon today, I just wanted to uh, teach extemporaneously on a few points. The first point was an introduction to Christology. Uh, the second point was... Uh, the full uh, divinity of the Son, and the third point was uh, the full humanity of Christ, God, the Logos. A lot of content. If, if you're confused, um, if you want more information, lots of sermons online. In fact, I have uh, um, just wrote a book on Christology not that long ago. You're more than welcome to come up and, and take a book, and uh, I pray that you were um, edified uh, by the sermon. Uh, most importantly, it's for Christ's glory. Um, at this time, we are going to uh, uh, pause because uh, we have uh, food coming uh, any moment now. So there's going to be a pizza readily available for everybody. We have about an hour and a half break. So around one o'clock, I just like to ask if uh, pizza is not suitable for you guys. I know if some of you guys have diets or if you want to go somewhere else. Uh, there's lots of places nearby. We have Subway. We have Cracker Barrel. There's a McDonald's if anybody else uh, wants anything else. Um, you're more than welcome to, to go, but I just ask that if you guys can be back here by one uh, sharp because we're going to start right on the dot at one o'clock. And uh, I believe it's Brother Scott will be um, at one o'clock preaching on the perfect righteousness of Christ. So I'm excited. I'm really excited and I'm grateful that you guys are here today. Um, additionally, if some of you guys, um, I also want to invite you guys uh, tomorrow for church. I believe a lot of people are staying over tomorrow, including... Uh, uh, Brother Bill and, and uh, Brother Scott, they're staying uh, with us for Lord's Day. So I'll invite you guys to join us uh, for Lord's Day worship tomorrow at 11 o'clock sharp. Um, with that said, let's pray and then we'll uh, be excused for lunch. Christ, we give you the glory. We rejoice in uh, your completed and saving work. We rejoice also at the fellowship that we have today from those uh, that have come here to, to hear about Christ to hear what he has accomplished, to hear about his perfect righteousness, to hear about uh, his hypostatic union. Uh, Father, thank you for this opportunity to have fellowship. And uh, I pray uh, for uh, continued uh, traveling mercies for everybody that's here. Um, and uh, just, Lord, I pray that we will have a, a wonderful time of edification among each other as we glorify you. In your blessed name we pray, Christ Jesus, amen. All right. Yeah, I believe food, it's on its way, so just be patient.